ESPN college basketball analyst Jay Billis joins us now to discuss. Jay, is this the end of college basketball's long national nightmare? It's the end of the government's portion of this, the, the, the criminal part of it, if you will. And look, I don't believe any of this was criminal. Uh, I think the government stretched the NCAA rules to its limit. Uh, and I don't happen to agree with the rulings in this case that these were criminal. But I think the government is now stepping out of this. They weren't hail hailed as heroes. Nothing matched up to what the government said as far as, uh, you know, they had uh, the NCAA playbook on cheating and they were going to clean everything up. Uh, so I think they're stepping out of this. And now this goes to the NCAA and the Committee on Infractions and the, the, the hearing process that the NCAA goes through. And we'll see what, what the NCAA does with it because now they can import information uh, and evidence from these trials. And, and it, it remains to be seen how much information the government that didn't come out in the trial, how much the government may share uh, with the NCAA and what cooperation, if any, with the criminal defendants the NCAA may get. Look, Jay, when this started a couple of years ago, and we're talking about a year and a half ago, the government announcing the arrests uh, after an investigation that had lasted a number of years, the promise was made by the Southern District in New York, the acting U.S. attorney at the time, that these trials, this case would expose, and these are his words, uh, these are the words of the U.S. District, the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District, this would expose the dark underbelly of college basketball. Is that what happened? To some extent, yes. I mean, I think what it did, Jeremy, was confirm to everyone that cheating occurs in, in, in basketball and football. Uh, that was also confirmed in one of these trials when Marty Blazer, who the NCAA knew about back in 2009, 2010, when he was, uh, he was charged with paying football players by the NCAA back at that time. Uh, so, look, it, it, we've had cheating in this game forever. Players have been paid forever. Was that confirmed here? Yes. Uh, but what we, did the Southern District of New York and the FBI deliver when they said, we have your playbook and they made all these threats? No. Uh, I, I think it was actually a pretty stern rebuke of the Southern District of New York that they only got convictions in three of the ten charges that they brought against Merle Code and Christian Dawkins. Now, look, these are serious deals, but but really, aside from the plea deals that they entered into where, uh, you know, somebody got 12 months, 12 to 15 months, we're looking at six months in, in, uh, of jail time and nine months for Jim Gatto uh, of Adidas. And, and that, that's that's not very much time. Uh, and and I, I think this was, a, this was a failure on the part of the government. The question is whether this is going to be a failure on the part of the NCAA going forward and the schools themselves. Because right, at least to this point, Jeremy, both LSU and, uh, and Arizona have shown very little inclination mm -hmm. they're going to do anything about this. And the question as well, of course, Jay, is you know, going after uh, these three men who ended up being convicted uh, – Two twice convicted, Jim Gatto, who you mentioned earlier, uh, having been convicted in the previous trial, and not going after the big, big fish, the big names, uh, the big coaches who are celebrities in their sport and beyond. Um, now, looking back at what happened and the fact that only Rick Pitino, among those coaches who were implicated, lost his job, was that the right strategy? Well, it, for the government, it was the right strategy just to gain convictions because the government's theory was that the schools were the victims here because they couldn't adequately give out their scholarships and uh, because players would be ineligible, that they were subject to economic harm uh, because of the use of ineligible players. So if the government alleged that the coaches were in on this and that was a focal point, uh, it would be a lot more difficult to gain convictions. And, and that's why evidence wasn't allowed in with regard to the, the, the alleged cheating of, of Sean Miller and Will Wade. Uh, the only time that came in, actually, was when the government brought it in. The defense really w was, uh, for any objection, was sustained when they were trying to get information in on, on both Miller and Wade. Uh, so the government intentionally left the head coaches out of this thing. Now, whether they do anything going forward, that, that, maybe that's a possibility. I don't know. I doubt it. Uh, I, th I think from a government standpoint, this has been a colossal waste of time and resources for what they wound up getting out of this. And usually the Southern District of New York, they're publicity seekers, and they didn't get the publicity out of this that they expected. I, I think they expected to be hailed somehow as heroes for coming in and trying to, trying to fix college basketball and all that stuff. And, uh, and really what's come out of this other than, uh, than, than Mark Emmert formed a commission 
that changed a little bit the recruiting model. Other than that, we haven't really seen any changes, and I don't see any major disincentives going forward uh, to go back to business as usual. I, I don't think we're going to see any change in a multi-billion dollar business. This black market economy, hey, it hadn't stopped in the first 100 plus years of its existence. I don't see it stopping going forward. And we'll see if this is enough disincentive for the behavior to change in the future. Jay Billis, it's always a pleasure hearing your insights. Thanks for joining us.